Bach with Clifka. Welcome to our seminar series. This is the last of our seminar series for 2013. Um, we've called these Meet the Neighbors, um, and it is our way of helping people learn about the other critters that share the bluff lands with us. Um, we're very glad that you're able to attend. Just this morning, I posted a listing of our upcoming events and field trips for 2014 onto our website, and I hope we'll see you at many of those events. Um, just briefly, we've got some real fun stuff planned. We have a program on archaeology. Um, we are doing our second run at an owl prowl in March. Um, we're going to do our frog frolic again. So I hope to see you on some of these field trips and programs. Today, I'm very happy that Corey is able to join us for this seminar, which I guess we could have titled The Weevils of White Rock, because I actually had some people ask me, is this a field trip since it's Weevils at White Rock? Um, so they're both at and of, um, but we get to enjoy the program today at the Annex, courtesy of Corey Byers. Corey is just about to complete his master's degree studies at Southeast Missouri State. He has conducted field research for a two-year period at our White Rock Nature Preserve here in Monroe County. Um, and by two years of research, I mean literally that. His research occurred at night times, it occurred at daytimes, it occurred in steaming hot summer weather, and even in the wintertime when he was very surprised to find weevils still active in the leaf litter um, at the Nature Preserve. He also has traveled to Phoenix to further his research and learn more about the rather complicated taxonomy of the weevils that he's devoted himself to studying. Um, for Clifftop, we find research such as Corey's to be extremely valuable. For one thing, we get to learn about something that we really don't know much of anything about. Um, biodiversity and biodiversity inventory remains a subject that is near and dear to us. The more we are able to learn about what creatures we coexist with, um, the better an organization I think we are becoming. For us, having Corey research what to us is a very obscure subject is an absolute delight and it's been a great learning experience. It's going to continue. Um, we wish Corey continued success in his future research. Our understanding is that he intends to become a doctoral candidate after a couple of months off. Um, but at any rate, Corey Byers graduated from Southeastern Missouri State. He has continued there in master's degree studies and this presentation is the result of much of his research at our White Rock Nature Preserve, as well as, I'm sure, intensive classwork, library, computer, and lab work. Corey, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, I'm happy to be here. As you said, uh, my name is Corey Byers, and if you can catch it up from Southeast Missouri State University. Uh, this two-year study, I learned a lot about these weevils. They are extremely difficult. So as we go along, I'll stand on this side. I do want it to be a discussion. So if there are anything that I say that just doesn't make sense to you, and just burning and you can't wait to the end, feel free just to stop and ask me to clarify. That's perfectly fine. It's just discussion on weevils. Let's see this so there are a few objectives. I want to introduce you to the weevils, and then just really briefly go over the families of weevils, because there are several different 
types of weevils, and I only studied one of those types. It's not my goal to sit there and bore you with taxonomy and things like that. Because they are so diverse, there aren't that many common names used, so I will have to use some scientific names. But I hope to do it in a way that you can understand and it won't bore you too terribly. Uh, and then I want to, as I go along, teach you about the ecology of these weevils, what they do, where they are, what they eat, go over collection techniques, how I collected weevils, or how you can collect and store weevils, and I have examples and things like that that I'll show you. And also go over what I uncovered at White Rock and talk about the weevils that we found there. So uh, most of you are probably familiar, in science we like to classify all of our organisms in a certain scheme of hierarchy. So we all know weevils, they are in the kingdom Animalia, they are animals. They're in the phylum Arthropoda, they're what we call arthropods. They have that hard outer shell or exoskeleton, things like spiders and crabs, they're all arthropods. Then the class Insecta, they are insects. So they have two antennae, two pairs of compound eyes, six legs, things you're familiar with. They're what we call in the order, or they're in the order of Coleoptera, which is the beetle family. That's all beetles, ladybug beetle, or ladybird beetles, flower beetles, weevils, they're all beetles. And here's where it gets a little bit more confusing, and I do hope to clarify that as we go along. It's what we call the superfamily Cuculianoidea. Now that's all weevils. So don't get caught up in that name if it's too confusing. That's just all weevils. What I say to White Rock was the family Cuculianidae, or you could say the true weevils. So we studied the true weevils at White Rock. So how is a beetle different? I already said they are insects. How we can determine if it's a beetle? They have four pairs of wings, and that outer wing, that I call the elytra, they're just hardened. You've probably seen a beetle before. That's what separates beetles from other insects. They also have chewing mouth parts, unlike things like mosquitoes or stink bugs, which have piercing mouth parts. Beetles have chewing mouth parts. And they are holometabolous. So what they call their, their type of development, they have a larval, pupil, and then an adult stage. They don't just shed and become an adult. They have to form a pupae, like butterflies or things like that, and form the adult. So when is a beetle a weevil? The most important thing, most beetles have uh, the head structure, but weevils have what we call a rostrum. That's that expanded head structure there. You can see it. These are just all different types of weevils. You can just get a glimpse of the diversity here. It's just an extended mouth part. Their mouth parts are at the end of that rostrum. That's what we call it. And that's what makes a weevil a beetle. I'm sorry, a beetle a weevil. So just real briefly, when we are, there are uh, what we call more primitive weevils. The true weevils are what was studied at White Rock. And I'll talk about maybe why I didn't choose all of the weevils. Uh, those are just the family names. Don't get too confused with those. That's just how we separate them. So some of the more primitive weevils. These arose around the same times as primitive plants like cycads and sequoias and junipers, things like that. Uh, not your flowering plants, which are more maybe advanced plant species. These weevils, they are more in temperate climates. We do have a few in this area. So altogether, there are 90 species and 24 genera of this really uh, primitive group of weevils. Like I said, I do keep the family name Nemonycidae because there aren't uh, common names I can use, but don't let that confuse you too much. Another form of weevil that you, it's possible you may have come in contact with, are what we call the fungus weevils. These evolve fungus feeding habits, and they feed more on decaying wood, wood fungus, and things like that. They're more diverse in the tropical areas, but we do have a few species in this area. Uh, next. For the weevils, we have the bellids. You can see they have a little bit of, or I'm sorry, they are a little bit smaller group of 375 species. They're more in South American areas, and they still are more of those uh, earlier primitive plants, ferns, things like that. At this time, the flowering plants hadn't arose yet. And uh, you can see how each of those still has that rostrum that determines that it is a weevil. These you definitely, we definitely do have in this area. 
what we call in the family, what we call atalabidae, or the leaf rollers. They're widespread. Most of the diversity is in more tropical areas. You may have actually seen these on your hikes or things like that. They tend to roll the leaves for their egg protection. And they also feed on a decaying plant matter. Uh, next, a more smaller group, and some debate whether it really should be separated like it is. There are only 10 species, and these weevils are only in the southern hemisphere, so you're not going to find them on your hikes or things like that. But I just wanted to show you that they do exist. And these are still associated with those primitive plants, those non-flowering plants, and things like that. The next group, the Brentids. These weevils, you can find at White Rock. Not necessarily these large, uh, these are called giraffe weevils. Pretty interesting, because they actually have a long neck. They're more in a tropical uh, climate. I just want to put it up there. These smaller weevils here, you can see at White Rock by the bucket pools in the springtime. You'll notice there are 4,000 species. That's one of the main reasons I didn't include them in the survey. At one point, I was going to study the true weevils and these weevils here. But you can see, as I was getting into it, they all look like this, almost every single one. When I was talking with some specialists uh, to decide a way that we could separate those or how we could determine what species was different, they kind of just shrugged and said, well, they're the pear-shaped weevil. So even specialists and weevils have difficulty determining that are separating these or determining which ones you actually have. So most people just say, yeah, that's a weevil, and put it to the side. So that's one of the main reasons I kept that out of the survey at White Rock. But just know we did come across those. And then keep in mind, the weevils you all saw before, those they're all, uh, they were the primitive weevils. They all have that straight antenna that will be important here in a second. So now after all that, if you saw the diverse, or the different types of weevils, you'll see the Kukulianidae, or I'll start saying the true weevils. These are the weevils that were actually surveyed at White Rock. Notice there are over 5,500 species. Now most of the diversity is in tropical areas, the southern hemisphere, um, in the rainforest and things like that. But a lot of the diversity does occur in this area. So you can see maybe why I didn't study all the weevils. I chose to narrow it down to just the true weevils because it was almost impossible to separate all of those different. These weevils are associated, I know this seems odd, with all taxa of terrestrial plants. <coughs> so every terrestrial plant has some weevil association with it. Uh, these weevils, uh, because they are so diverse, they can be used as plant and bio weed control, things like that. Uh, what's it called? The uh, Russian thistle, I believe. A weevil was introduced in, I don't think Illinois possibly, but at least more north of us to control things like that. They, these weevils are herbivorous for the most part, so they can be used to try and control more invasive or inventive plants that come in our area. Um, you might have even heard of the milfoil weevil. That's an aquatic weevil, but that milfoil can just take over. It's an aquatic plant. They can just take over ponds and things like that. So they introduced this European weevil to try and maybe control plants. But weevils are used commonly for that type of manner to control plant spread. Oh, and then uh, notice the bent and tinny on those weevils. So just real quick, just an overview of what we went over. And if don't get caught up in these names if they are confusing you too much. Just know that there are different types of weevils. So this uh, is a phylogenetic tree, standard hypothesis of time. The chrysomeloids are what you, we know as the flower weevils, or leaf, or I'm sorry, flower beetles or leaf beetles, things like that. With the evolution of a rostrum, these beetles diverge from that family. And then you can see here where fungus feeding habits evolved. And eventually, with the uh, wind flowering plants, what we call angiosperms, arose, that's when most of the diversity of these weevils took place. And even further, weevils, they uh, adapted habit habits where instead of having bent antenna, they actually had an elbow, I'm sorry, straight, they had bent antenna, and they were able to move into the greater diversity of the flowering plants. So just real basic, when is a weevil a true weevil? If you forget everything else I say, all those family names, all that taxonomy, everything else I'm talking about up here, 
I want you to remember when a weevil is a true weevil. So if you see an insect, you know it's a beetle, it has a hard outer wing, and it has that rostrum that, this is a pretty dramatic example, but that long extended mouthpiece and those bent and tinny, odds are you have a weevil. That's the one main objective I have for this dog, to figure out what, what a true weevil is. There are other features that separate these true weevils from those more primitive ones we were talking about, but they're either tiny or they require dissection. It's just too messy. Mm. So that bent and tinny, why did that allow these weevils to diversify? Why did it allow them to move into so many of those different plants and just spread across all the continents? It's hypothesized that when they, they're in tinny, um, when they adapt to the habits where they could bend back further, I just realized, I used the word geniculate, that's a word for bent, I meant to put bent back in there. But uh, geniculate antenna hypothesis means the bent antennae hypothesis. It's hypothesized they were actually able to bend their antennae a little further back up that rostrum, and they could insert that, that deeper into plant tissues or soil. And they uh, used that rostrum to lay their eggs. So now that they could put their rostrum further into plants or soil, they could lay their eggs deeper. Laying their eggs deeper allowed them to avoid drying out, or allowed their insect or their larvae to be inside of uh, seeds or things like that and have a greater food source. And I hypothesize this is why weevils were so successful, just because of that benzene. So when you have your weevil, there are just a few basic uh, parts or the structures of the, on the weevil I want you to be familiar with. One is that rostrum. That's the main uh, part of a weevil that you should know. When you're, if you want to know more about weevils and you want to determine which species you have, you will have to look at more smaller features. Obviously, you won't have a microscope with you out in the field or things like that, so it would be impossible. But uh, things specialists use to determine which weevil they have are tarsal, which is claw or foot structure of a weevil, how many are there, et cetera, how long they are. This structure here that I have circled, you can think of it as the shoulder of the weevil. It's actually called the mesopimeron, but it's more just the shoulder of the weevil. That's a really important structure with these beetles that helps us determine which one we actually have. And you can see how small that would be, and that would just be impossible in the field. So, like I said earlier, how do you know if you're looking at a true weevil? So if you're in the field and you have that beetle, are the antennae elbowed? That's one of the main things. If it has a rosh on their elbow, you have a true weevil in front of you. None of those primitive weevils have that structure. And it's also important to look at your habitat and plant type. That can help you determine which weevil you're looking at. Sometimes uh, when you're identifying these weevils, and I, I don't want to confuse you with taxonomy and things like that, but you'll, sometimes you do have to know, well, I have a weevil in front of me, but which which weevil is it? I mean, you can't just say weevil sometimes. Which one am I looking at? The diversity is so great that they separated, remember we call it a family, even further into subfamily. These types of separations are um, so similar that picture guides are almost impossible. You're never going to find a Peterson's guide to weevils or things like that. It would just be near impossible out in the field. So one of the, it's, one of the main things is because become familiar with very small features. Some of those you can see when you're on your hikes and you're finding these weevils. You will be familiar with them. But you just learn to key in on really small features on these insects. Just so you get an idea of what the subfamilies are, I'm not quiz you or have you memorized these or anything, I just threw up a list. The ones highlighted are the ones you see on that uh, form you picked up when you walked in, those are the ones that we actually found at White Rock. With this slide, I just wanted to show you that other weevils do exist, we just didn't uncover them at White Rock. So now we can actually move into the true weevils and talk about what they look like, where they are, things like that, now that we're past all those primitive weevils. And when I can, I will try and use a uh, common names because some do exist. I'll put the subfamily name at the top, but 
Don't let that one confuse you too much. So dry up thorny. These are what you know, and maybe instead of weevils, you may have heard them called billbugs. Have you ever heard that phrase before? They're the most ancestral of the subfamilies. It's hypothesized that they arose first before the other weevils. Uh, some consider actually separating, moving them out of the true weevils, but most uh, scientists kept them in, so I kept them in. One of the ways you can recognize these gill bugs is they're large, larger than most other weevils. They're often darkly patterned. Uh, they'll be like real dark reds or oranges and speckle. They're pretty significantly different in size than most other weevils. They are one of the most larger true weevils, those gill bugs. Are they the size you're really holding up? Yeah. <laughs> no, I guess really that was pretty holding. dramatic. I, I'll show you one. There, I would say they're probably half an inch, and that's large for a weevil, or maybe even an inch. We measure them in millimeters. The weevils are very, very, very small. And I have brought, uh, brought some so you can actually see what they look like. And I'll, after the talk, I'll let you go through them and everything. But you can see the actual size and what they actually look like, because it's extremely different than on these slides. You can understand why those features are so small. But no, they aren't that large. It'd be nice and make things easier. But no, these are the most, they are larger. And they're associated with monocots and asters, sunflowers, even corn, things like that. So at White Rock, on, if you've ever been to White Rock, there's a hill prairie called Edna's Dell. And that's actually where I found most of these billbugs. This huge long name here. Rhodobianus rhodosymphonitatus, just this guy here, this orange speckled weevil. That is pretty significant, uh, that most other species will not look like this one. Uh, an example of other, two other bill bugs are there. They're actually very similar. You can see like they don't actually look that close at all. Most of these you will see on the hill prairies. You won't often see these weevils on wooded areas. Even if you do come across those types of plants in the wood areas, they prefer more open field type areas. They avoid aquatic habitats for the most part, too. So these billbugs you're going to find on the prairies for the most part. The namesake weevils, the Pulianines, they're one of the most diverse subfamilies. I searched for a way to tell you about the subfamily in a simple way, and it was almost just impossible. There were traditionally just a few species in this subfamily. Those acorn or plum weevils there with that huge, dramatically extended rostrum. But as more and more weevils were uncovered, and scientists were trying to classify them, they couldn't make it fit in the groups of the others, a lot of these different weevils. So this subfamily has sort of become a lost and found. Sort of a, let's just place it here until somebody else can look at it. So you can see the diversity within this, because these don't look alike at all, but they're actually classified in the same group, possibly as being similar. They prefer various habitats, these weevils. So when you think of a weevil, most often you'll think of things like maybe even just prairie areas, these weevils, you might see them out on the prairies. But you can't actually find weevils in those environments. That white rock, these are just some examples of species that I uncovered. These acorn weevils, one of my favorite, they have that long rostrum. You will find those pretty frequently in the late summer when you're on your hikes. I actually picked up two that are in my collection that were just on my shirt. They're, they arise all at once and they're flying around in the woods. These guys, up in the right, they did occur uh, several times on the hill prairies. You can see how different they look from those, from the ones in the bottom. Are any of these weevils that are found in the region uh, specific to uh, certain plant species? Some are, yes. The acorn weevil here is associated strictly with those trees, those acorns. Which, what kind of oak are we talking about? It's not necessarily uh, species of oak, just oak trees. Okay, so they will they, they will use utilize any acorn. Yeah, mm -hmm. they actually lay. They have that huge extended rostrum, and they can bend those and tinny back and insert it fully into the acorn, and then use that rostrum to take their egg and put it into the acorn. So if you find an acorn with a little hole in it, mm -hmm. 
would that indicate then that, that it's highly likely likely yeah other insects can some wasps utilize do that as well don't they or wasps and then some will just mine in there and eat it themselves but that is indicative of a weevil that we see it's very likely yeah mm -hmm. uh, the other the other two species they're generalists a lot of these what we call the Kukulian lines, these Kukulia weevils are just generalists and they're found in every habitat they can be in. Corey, does the acorn weevil, does the egg and function larvae, does it completely destroy the acorn? It does once it hatches, because then it eats the acorn itself. I don't know if it completely destroys it, I don't know if it's not viable any longer, but it does eat a lot of the inside of that acorn. Not enough that it would be detrimental to both populations, sure. but it would probably. The generalists, though, are either they, they couldn't be generalists on herbaceous versus woody. Is that correct? Some are more generalists in woody areas versus that. Some are, yes. Some will just eat whatever they can find. As when I say. Whether it's woody or herbaceous. Right. Because weevils can <coughs> utilize all parts of uh, a plant. Not necessarily. Every species can utilize all parts, but a weevil can utilize all parts of a plant, if that makes sense. Yeah. And those more generalist species might be able to feed on the more woody parts and the leaves and the fruits and the flowers, while these more specific weevils would just feed on the acorns. This one was extremely interesting to me at first, and I had to think about it for a second. These Bagolines, these, they're more aquatic weevils. We find them usually only in aquatic habitats. And then I did uncover them on uh, the North Prairie several times in that collection. They have a more varnish-like coating. They resemble most others. Those are distinguishing features I can really tell you about them. Just that they occur in aquatic settings. And I said, think about it. Why was this aquatic weevil on those hill prairies? If you've ever been to White Rock, or if you're familiar with the hill prairies here in this county, they occur along the, uh, along the Mississippi floodplain, which though that is, you know, several hundred feet higher, these weevils do have wings, so maybe those weevils are moving from that lower, where they have those ditches, some people have wetlands near there, moving from that environment to the hill prairies. But this isn't the only occurrence of aquatic species. I found several, what we would think of as aquatic or semi-aquatic weevils at White Rock, which we all know is this upland. Habitat. This subfamily, the baradines, one of the main ways you can know that you have a baradine is they have that uh, dense black varnish. And so those don't look like this. That's where the easy part stops. This is one of those families that um, when these weevils were first being uncovered and scientists were describing them, they realized that they were extremely difficult. And then more than one scientist were working on naming these. People were naming the same species different names. And it's become so difficult, no one's actually looked at it since then. So it would be very hard for me to tell you which species you have, except for a few that we found at White Rock. I put this entire species name up there, Cliptobarus leconchii, this species here. Notice it has those yellow scales, I'm sitting in front of the screen, those yellow scales in the back. Nothing else, no other weevil will look like that. So if you come across this weevil, and you may, it was pretty common out on those hill prairies, you know that you have the species Glyptobarus lacontii. Nothing else will look like that weevil with those yellow scales, or you can think of hairs on the back like that. Mm -hmm. And again, this species here, normally it's normally what we think of as an aquatic species, but it was uncovered on the hill prairies. Whoops. If you've ever been out on the hill prairies or on any prairie during the spring, you know that some uh, plants like to flower around that time. A lot of these uh, small, dark, uh, baradine weevils utilize that. They're more generalists. They feed on these flowering species. They lay their eggs in these flowering species. They love uh, springtime. They were most abundant on the hill prairies. Of course, when they're flying around, they do end up in wooded areas, but they love those areas with those flowering plants. We collected um, hundreds of specimens, and I'll go over collection techniques, but we used, one of the ways that we did it was with a sweep net, 
and we were just collect hundreds of these bear guns on these hill prairies. They were collected from things you may be pretty familiar with. You probably can't see it from back there. It, this is actually a picture with the weevils just climbing all over this bee balm. We collect them on things like spiderwort, fleabane, if you're familiar with that type of stuff, all over the hill prairies. These weevils here on the subfamily Pseudorhynchini, they're common all throughout the year. And this is actually another surprising thing to me, because when I was collecting some of these weevils, I kept collecting even during the winter time, which is the time that you think most insects aren't around. We would sift through leaf litter, and I would find out just tons of these little guys, either just laying or even active, once they thawed, they weren't being killed by the frosts. They are both terrestrial and aquatic species. They are associated with mustards, usually things like that, but they can be generalists. And these are very, very small. You can see the surface of the leaf here. That's the size of a weevil. And I believe this used to say uh, 0.1, or no, 1 millimeter. <coughs> you can see an example of how small these are. And there wasn't really one distinguishing feature I could give you to pull out this subfamily, a really easy one, definitely not one you'd be able to see in the field, except for they kind of have a more lumpy back, you could think of it like that. But there wasn't really a feature I could give you, I just wanted to, you know, this is what we remember. These, we didn't collect them in White Rock, but I just wanted to show you. They're one of my favorites. They have these large eyes that almost touch, it's like they're wearing some sort of helmet or something. They're they have more southern ranges, the Texas, Arizona, and even south into Mexico and South America. But I just wanted to throw it up there because it's one of the most interesting weevils, I think. For the most part, if you collect this one, it doesn't look like anything else. Their eyes, some of them actually are not <coughs> fused, but they just cover the head completely. The Cosanine weevils, these uh, true weevils are often slung, or slung, long and slender. They are black or brown, and they're associated with uh, woody, dead material. That was one representative of white rock. And this was almost collected as an afterthought. I was hiking along the trail, and I noticed that there was a, just a hollow where some creature had been burrowing, and there was debris and sawdust there. I thought, why not? And I took it, and I sifted it, and I uh, sifted through it, and I'll explain that in more detail how I sifted through it. But I sifted through it, and looked through it back in the lab, and I found just tons of these species. After identifying them and finding out which one I had, was a little note in my key that said only associated with hollows of oak trees. And I had just uh, sifted through a hollow of an oak tree. I didn't even know that, that was the case. They're so specialized, they're only found in the hollows that animal mat uh, matter at in those trees. There is another uh, I did put a slide on there. Another relative of this in this subfamily that's only associated with squirrel nests. But only found in squirrel nests. I, I mean, I'm, I didn't collect any, I didn't find any squirrel nests. But yeah, they're that, they're that specialized. Corey, the ones that live only in the hollows of the oak trees, do they have a period of the year in which they'll swarm and move to. I don't know much about their life history. It wasn't until recently that I realized what I had until just a few months ago, and I found that note, and I compared it with my notes and saw where I collected it and realized that that's where I, I collected from that oak tree. So I don't know much about their life history. I don't know if they would swarm or what they're doing there, why they require that, but it was interesting. I know the, the ones that are in the school nests don't ever swarm. They just feed off what, they let the school do all the work for them, bring back their nests, chewing up bits of food and leaving it, and they eat the debris there. So I don't know if they're utilizing some of the, doing the same type of thing when those animals are in that area, just eating off their food, but I don't know. These, you'll notice uh, on that list, there are several on there, and this name looks a lot like the other subfamily, it's crypto -rinkening. They have the same type of life history, they're common all throughout the year, and all through the leaf litter. These guys are very, very hard to see. You probably would go to just uh, hike along the trail and look down and see, oh, that's a crypto rink. They're often dirty and crusted, and they camouflage very, very well with the environment. 
And that's actually a determining factor when you're uh, identifying them. It says, is it dirt encrusted? Are all of these species dirt encrusted? What if there's a rain or something? Anyway, the cyclamines, this one was interesting. Uh, many species are inventive, which means they've come from a different area, and semi aquatic. And I actually uh, collected a few of these on the hill prairies. I put the species name there because it is distinguishing. They're known to feed on carrots. They, their larvae and adults will mine carrots. Carrot okay. family? Carrot family? Carrot family. Or actually, no, I'm sorry, just carrots, not carrot family. Just, uh, but not domestic carrots, necessarily. You're talking about wild carrots. You're talking about I feel like it utilized domestic carrots. But you're well. talking about Dawkins Corona. But like, would they be on Queen Anne's Lace? Yeah. See, they wouldn't be on Queen Anne's Lace. Okay. When, they, when I say carrots, I mean actual, the ones that form vegetable. carrots. That's yeah. oh. The vegetable. Does Queen Anne's Lace, do, the, do they it's have? in the carrot family. There's a lot of stuff in Hill Prairie. ABAC, yeah. they, they, do they make, a, they they make a tuber. They make a carrot-like tuber. But yeah. most things I found about this one, they were just oh, talking oh. about those large, the, what we think of as the vegetable yeah. carrot. Huh. That's what they were but you found about. one at White Rock. I did find one at White Rock. Did you find a carrot? I didn't find a carrot. I don't have carrots lying around, so who knows? I know, I don't know any so of the some farms, carrots. Some hikers probably toss their lunch. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see any carrot farms along the way to White Rock. Who knows? It was We're not very using any carrot habitat restoration. Right. Right. Yeah. No, no, I know no, no carrots that White But it, it was very surprising. See, like, this a lot of rabbits in the area for the carrot might be? I didn't, but you never know. I mean, it was pretty surprising. I, I couldn't explain it. <coughs> it was, and it was confirmed. By a weevil specialist, that's what. Well, then it's there. clear Marty Kemper was there. <laughs> he cares yeah. to he carrots out. for every lunch. He's a steak <laughs> buyer. He's the guy that's going around weevils everywhere. Like, that's they, it. They, they, of course, we have to organically grow carrots. <laughs> <laughs> so they have organically grown weevils. There you go. Did, did, did you find just one specimen? It was just one. Huh. Just mm -hmm. one of it's this. Kemper. So, I mean. <laughs> It wasn't enough for me to say significantly that, yes, they are everywhere on the on that white rock. It was just one that I collected. But oddly enough, it was carrot weevil. Hey, Corey, I got yes. a question. Go um, ahead. OK, since so they eat all these plants, is there somebody that eats them? Whatever could come across them. They don't have a specific weevil predator, but birds could eat the weevils, whatever would come across them. There's nothing that, we, that I know of that is just a weevil specialist or a weevil predator. So these, you would be able to determine in the field. So one of my favorite families, they're one of the easiest families. We call those the broad-nosed weevils. They do have a common name that you can memorize. They have all those scientific names. They still have what we call the rostrum, that long mouth part, but it's more, uh, it's shrunk and more broadened. It's very distinguishable. And these are, uh, oh, I'll show you one. They are large enough. They are large enough that you could see them in the field. You would know that you had a broad-nosed weevil in your hand. So that's two things you can take to the field. If you know that one's a true weevil, and is it uh, broad-shum shortened, it's probably a broad-nosed weevil. These are almost always in wooded areas. They often don't venture into the prairies, the glades, or things like that. They just utilize wooded areas. I put a picture of this specimen up just because it is so distinguishable. I couldn't find, uh, should have taken a picture of one, but I couldn't find a picture where their arms were out. But their upper prolegs are extremely extended, and they have, excuse me, they have huge femurs that are very expanded, and they stick out. So that's one feature that you could know, just like that you had this weevil. It has a pretty difficult name to memorize, and there isn't a common name for it, but it is pretty distinguishable. So at White Rock, these entomines, or the broad nosed weevils, I'm sorry, are many are introduced or invented. They come from other areas, mm. including the Asiatic oak weevil. And uh, the, what we call sort of pistimus, or sort of pistimus pestinis, which are the best Asiatic oak weevil, and that's sort of pistimus. These are inventive, and some people all even call them invasive. I wouldn't say they were a pest in my opinion, or that stands for. But some people do call them invasive. We tend to just use the word inventive, meaning they come from a different area. They didn't originate in this area. 
but they can, in large groups, completely defoliate environments. And we did uncover a lot of these at White Rock. I wouldn't think there are a lot there that are causing any extreme damage, but they were in pretty abundance, a pretty big abundance at White Rock, those Asiatic oak weevils. These weevils, they have larger bodies, not as large as the first ones we were talking about. And when I say large, again, I mean five millimeters versus one millimeter. I wouldn't say large usually. So pretty distinguishable. They uh, enjoy variable habitat, but most are semi-aquatic. Again, semi-aquatic. And I found them all over the uh, hill prairies. They're very, very common on that north prairie, if you've ever been out there, in an uh, area that I was referring to as the glade. Their larvae mine stems. They'll chew into those stems and lay their eggs. And that's an example there. And they'll form what we call galls, where that stem will be expanded. That's where their egg has been laid. Well, some other insects do that too. So just because you see a gall, you might, it might not be a weevil in there, but they do form those galls when they put their eggs in there. Frequently stem galls. Yes, yeah, stems, because they don't, some can utilize roots, but they don't. These would just be in the stems. Are they associated with any particular plant? <coughs> some are, not the ones that were uncovered. The ones at White Rock were sort of generalists on those types of stems. It is more uh, monocots, so uh, no. your yes. asters and uh, other species like that. Corn. Plant we're pretty familiar with here. This group here, I uncovered so many that I had to tell you about them. I didn't really want to. They're my least favorite group. Uh, people often say they have simple scales with robust legs and form, but I threw up an example of how dramatically different they can be used in this subfamily. So there wasn't one feature I could just tell you to say, yep, that's a mullet vine. It's another one of those lost and found type groups, which they strongly resemble. That other group I was talking about, the Kuda nines, they're very difficult to identify. Unfortunately, at White Rock, not unfortunately, but we had several. They're in a uh, group, are a, they're a species of conotracheliths. They're all highly similar. On your paper, I don't have them all memorized, but conotracheliths, meso, and some of those, each one of these is an example of that different species. Mm. And you can see just how similar they were. I placed them all in the same species, but they were not. Everything in this family is very, very similar, and some of it probably needs revision. Are you taking most of the photos of these insects? Some of them, yes. The others were ones I tried to put copyright from uh, either friends or just friends of friends that were on Bug Guide. These were actually. Uh, Taken by a friend of Robert Anderson from Bug Guide. But I didn't take these now. Another, another and the final stuff I'm going to talk about is pretty distinguishable these bark beetles. They used to just be in their own family, they were just called the bark beetles. But recently, due to uh, genetic data, they realized that they are actually. Weevils. You wouldn't even think of them as weevils. They don't have that rostrum. It's, if they, you want to call it a rostrum, it's extremely reduced. I don't want to jump around too much, but it's hypothesized. Uh, here are these cosmines we were talking about that were just so, so specified in those trees and that litter. They think, or scientists think, that because they specialize in the area, they actually uh, evolved into those scolotines. or the bark beetles. You can see how some of their body plans are. Their life histories are very similar. They're both associated strictly with those trees. The bark beetles, there are over 6,000 species, so adding even more diversity to these true weevils. If our lives weren't difficult enough already, we place them with the other true weevils. They're what we call phloophagus. They feed on the phloem of these uh, plants. They exist, and it's pretty interesting, in harems under bark. You've probably seen this before. 
these galleries are what they're referred to as under bark. These bark beetles exist in harems. There will be one male with several females all in those galleries. And he provides the genetic data for those females. And they separate. And when other males are formed, they're either killed or they form their own harem further up along the tree. These are strictly associated with trees. You won't find these in the prairies. They live under the bark. You can probably, you know, most often they're located by what we call frass or sawdust that they leave out of those holes. You've probably seen it before. So, so anytime you see that, is that specifically beetles? For the most, yes, for the most part, it is beetles. Often you see this? For the most part, it's beetles. Either they're larvae <coughs> or beetles like this, the adults. It won't always be these bark beetles. Right. For the most part, it is. Okay. All species beetles. of trees. <coughs> yes. They love pines. There's a pine bark beetle, and I'll, next I'll show you a picture. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have been to Colorado before. But you know, when you're, if you've ever been there, you're driving through when all of those acres of pine trees have just been have died off or are dying. That's because uh, some of these weevils are serious pests. It's not always that those bark beetles themselves are killing the tree, but they carry a fungus. And because they spread so much, because those males are forming their own colony or group, they're spreading from tree to tree to tree, spreading that fungus, and it's just wiping out those pine trees. <coughs> it's not really an issue that we have to worry about here in Illinois, but in those more western states, especially recently. I just drove through the summer and it was awful. Just acres of these trees are dying. Some of these old growth forests too, older trees that have been there for a long time are just dying off. Because so of there's a major economic impact. Mm -hmm. This, uh, which this I was aware of as a forester, I'm aware of that, mm -hmm. and I'm aware of that, some others too. But um, does that drive and help fund research for the study of weevils and for, for folks like you? We or? hope so. Uh, <coughs> there isn't uh, a lot, they more want to study the fungus itself, okay. they know the life history of the beetle. Not the life history. Mm -hmm. And because these uh, and are these natives that are doing this, or are these ones that have been native? Native. Okay. It was the fungus that strictly the fungus came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not healthy to the tree. I mean, they are feeding on the tree and living under that bark, so they could cause issues. But what's killing the tree is mainly the fungus that they're carrying. And uh, they're difficult to uncover. I know, or I think I know, there are a lot more at White Rock than what. I surveyed, but they're just pretty difficult to trap. They're so, so tiny. When I say tiny, I'm talking tiny relative to the other weevils. These guys are almost impossible to see. Uh, they are attracted by ethyl alcohol, so you can set traps. One of the ways that people that study these weevils, what they do, because they are species specific to species of trees. So they find the weevil they want to study, and they'll cut down that tree they know it's associated with, come back to it in six months, and then break apart the bark and see if they're there. That just wasn't really feasible uh, to survey that way. I thought they are attracted to ethyl alcohol, but you have to monitor the trap pretty frequently. What else? I think that's the last one about those. The, uh, mm -hmm. the one weevil that was eating the, uh, in the hollows of trees, eating the dead material, is yeah. that correct? Strictly living on I think I don't know much about that life history, oh, but I'm okay. assuming they are feeding off the oh, you dead said they evolved them to a living tissue bark beetle. As well. Yes, it's hypothesized that these uh, bark beetles actually evolved from those weevils, and that's why they collapsed. I mean, that is supported by genetic data, but very, very similar to those cosonines. Very similar. I mean, do, do the adults and larvae always feed on the same plant materials? Or other weevil It's very weevil specific. In the case of the bark beetles, yes. With those generalists, more generalist species like the ones we saw in the prairie, those dark paradigms, those they would feed on whatever they could come across. So to finish up uh, those subfamilies, hopefully you sort of have an idea of how extremely diverse this family is how many of these weevils there are. It's a, there's a paper where it mentions in there that at the current rate of uncovering and describing these weevils, it would take 650 years to know exactly how many weevils are on Earth right now. 
there are, when I say described, I mean the scientists have looked at them and named them, gave them a scientific name. There are hopes of Weevil just sitting in people's labs. They just don't have the time to sit there and just describe and tell you why it's different than you know, this. But they know what it is, you can see it is. And you'll see on that paper, and I'll mention it again later, where I have n.sp, that means there's no species. Which doesn't really make sense. I mean, we have it in front of us. Why doesn't it have a species name? No one's gotten around to naming it yet. So we have that insect which doesn't have a species name. So at White Rock, and here's where I get to just do a show and tell and show you all the ways that we got to collect. Uh, one of the main ways I collected was with sweep nets and bead sheets. We call it a sweep net. You've probably seen an aerial net before that used to catch dragonflies and butterflies. This is a bit different. It's a thicker material. So on mornings where the dew was out or when it was rainy or whatever, I could still sweep some of the plant material and my net wouldn't be uh, tied up and it's a stronger material so it wouldn't rip in the more wooded areas. But I would sweep both wherever I, every habitat I walked into. I would sweep uh, the prairies, I would sweep the wooded areas, and I would of course keep this separate and then dump that out and pick out what weevils I could see and then take those back to the lab and identify them. We also used what was called uh, a feet sheet. I had never heard of it before, but I saw some other people collecting. What? What are you doing? And they showed me they called it a feet sheet. And it's actually a pretty common method of collecting weevils. All most weevils have an odd habit of when they get scared or frightened or if something disturbs them, they drop. They just drop off whatever plant material they're on and land on the ground and work their way back up. So you can utilize that defense by holding this underneath the plant you want to collect from, or the tree, or whatever it may be, and then just hitting the tapping this tree or tapping the plant, and the weevils just fall onto your beach sheet. It's actually really, really effective, because with, on this white material, you can just pick them off. Like, mm -hmm. But this I used a lot. Keep that there. And feel free to ask any questions about the collection devices. Pitfall and baited traps. I didn't necessarily use pitfall traps. Uh, I have a friend who did a study on faults, and she was showing me how she used those. That's actually where you dig a hole, and you put a Tupperware container, and you'll have a funnel inside that container. I didn't have one in the lab to bring with me, but just a Tupperware container in the ground with a funnel in it, with alcohol in it. And the hole is uh, small enough to where like mammals and things wouldn't be able to fall into it. But as insects walk across the ground, they would just fall into the ethyl alcohol, and you sift through that and collect the ones you want. I didn't use that too often, because I didn't want to collect in that way. But she was doing ants. Right? She was doing ants. Right. Yeah, she is doing ants. But yeah, it was highly successful for those ants. But that is a way you can collect for these weevils, the ones that are more in the leaf litter. You just sit the trap down, you come back to it later, and you go through the alcohol. I did not use that very often. I say baited traps because those bark beetles, they are associated, but they do like ethyl alcohol. They are attracted to ethyl alcohol. So you can make traps with those. I didn't use it very often at White Rock. I tried one time and it didn't work out. But some people are very, very successful with it. There's what we call Berlazi or Winkler funnels. And on the next slide, I'll go into that in more detail. But here's a Winkler. It's a funny name, but it's what we call a Winkler sampling device. And that's how I collected most of my material. We did uh, leaf litter sifting. So we did just the, that. We made these buckets. We put, I put a screen on the bottom. And we just walked to the habitat after we had swept through. And we'd go to certain areas, like on the prairie or the glade or the wooded areas. And we would pick up that leaf litter or that prairie duff and sift it through this uh, screen material. And in the smaller leaves, we put into a pillowcase and label that where we collected it from. Bring that pillowcase back into the lab. Uh, and I'll go to the next slide here. So we also use black lighting events <coughs> more during the warmer months because some insects, as you, most of you know, are attracted to light. Weevils are no different. Some weevils are very attracted to light, the ones that are active at night. And so we use black lights. We use a halogen light and a black light. They're at Madeline's Rest, if you know where that's at, where the sign, the white rock and all that. We hung a, sh a sheet up between two trees and just shined a light on it, set it, stared at it for a couple hours, and picked off the beetles or the weevils. Hmm. 
And then, of course, just good old-fashioned hand collecting. You would just walk around the prairies, the wooded areas, looking on the plants, looking on the leaves, and just collecting the leaves you found. Back to those winklers. So, a lot of scientists and uh, insect scientists or entomologists use Berlazy funnels. They require electricity. They would take leaf litter, like I was collecting, or plant matter, and put it in this container or a sheet, it's usually metal, and then they would plug it in and turn the light on and hang it. And as that material dried, those insects, like a more moist environment, would move or fall out through the screen and into their container of ethyl alcohol. That wasn't very convenient. Uh, there's a nice lady in Brazil who makes these called Winkler funnels. They use gravity. We still dry out the material. They rely on gravity. I don't have to have electricity. So if you're on like long uh, collecting trips, you can stay a week or two week or two weeks and collect while you're there and dry it out there and have your samples and just keep collecting and keep drying out. Uh, for the most part, I took them back to uh, the greenhouse at Simo and dried them there. That leaf litter that was in pillowcases, you just empty it into this type of device, and these strings hold it from opening up too far so you don't overpack the materials because it has to dry out. And you put all the leaf matter or the uh, prairie matter, and you make sure to label it. You wouldn't want to mix it up inside this winkler. And as it dried, those insects would move out or fall out, and they would be able to cling to the side of this material, and they would fall into my container of ethyl alcohol. You have your leaves collected right there, you just bring it back to the lab and you go through them. I utilize that very, very often. And I was curious, and I was sampling in the winter months just because I wanted to see, and someone mentioned that there were uh, adults active in the winter months, and I actually covered a lot of adults with that leaf litter in the winter months. A lot. A lot more than you would expect. So the reason we use so many different types of collecting methods and variation is because that brings diversity. Not all weevils are going to come to lights. Not all weevils are going to be in the leaf litter or going to be in the prairie litter. Some just stay up in the canopies of trees or whatever. So you have to make sure to uh, sample in, with many different forms of sampling devices. I, I've said a few times those bark beetles are attracted to ethyl alcohol. Some weevils are active at dusk versus dawn. You can imagine with these weevils being so diverse, of course they are diverse when they're active. So just be aware, if you're looking for weevils, of their ecology and their habits, because you know what plant they're associated with. If you're looking for a certain weevil, you can just go to that plant and say, associate the whole preserve. Just a little note, when you are collecting, especially when I was collecting, you always label. Label before, label during, label after. You're going to sit this down, and you say, I don't remember what that's from. Come back to it in two weeks, and you won't remember it. You won't remember it. Like, I know. You're going to sit in your car, like, I'll come back to it, and you're going to forget just always label. It doesn't have to be a real fancy label. That's an example of how I label the insects in my collection. You just put the state, where they're from, the date, and then who collected it. But if you're just doing it for yourself, so you can just put where you got it and the date. That will help you out in the future, especially if you find out things are associated in certain habitats. So you probably have a glimpse now of how identifying, how difficult identifying these different species of weevils can be. So a lot of the times when, especially for a survey like this, you identify them yourself in the lab. This is an example if you've never seen one before. So if you want to know more than just um, this is a true weevil or this is a bark beetle, you use what's called a dichotomous key. And there's a key for each subfamily. Most insects, I'll tell you, just have family keys, but these weevils are so diverse we have to use subfamilies. And it's just sort of, you can think of it as instructions or step by step that leads you, I'm going to show you a page, that leads you to your weevil. Just little couplets each time. Basically, the same things like does it have a rostrum, does it not have a rostrum? You go to the next step, does it have wings, does it not have wings? Basic stuff. With these weevils, it's a lot more difficult and a lot more arguable sometimes. <coughs> things like are the mandibles crossed or are the mandibles slightly crossed? Mm. Is the claw a millimeter? Is it a 1.5 millimeter? Ridiculous things. Those two are the most people studying weevils rely on. But he's self-taught, not formally taught. Is that what you're saying? With the weevils, I don't. I'm not sure where he's oh. learning with weevils. But 
when you're studying Weavos, there are two people that you should become friends with. Hmm. It's hard to do by yourself. It's possible, it's very possible, but it would be hard to learn uh, self-taught. <coughs> White Rock, so the survey I did, most of you know the White Rock Nature Preserve is in Monroe County. It's 306 acres of large upland uh, oak hickory forest, if you've never been there before. It has what we call uh, hill prairies. These prairies are on the side of these Mississippi bluffs. I don't know if you, most of you are probably familiar with White Rock. If not, I should definitely go. Uh, I say three habitat types. I say the weevils in the hill prairies, what I call the glade, and then the forested areas. So both hill prairies, both the North Prairie and Edmonds Dell, are two large ones at White Rock. And then just a little plug about White Rock. It's very beautiful if you've never been before. There's a nice hiking trail through there. You can definitely check it out. It's just a few minutes that direction. So why did I do a survey? Ken kind of talked about that in her introduction. Why, why would you even survey weevils? Well, that's very difficult. Why would, you, why would you do that? I wanted to provide accurate regional data. I wanted to see, so what weevils are there and how many are there? They are uh, so tiny. Why, I, I wanted to uh, provide a list that we could know what was occurring. Surveys, when they are done, they're often spotty and frequent. They're very time consuming. I wish I would have had more years to do the survey. I need more time to finish up. Uh, especially things like weevils, you have to keep going back because these, they may not all be there at one time. It's not necessarily sexy science. You're not going to really publish a survey in nature or science or things like that. It's a lot of times people don't choose to do surveys, but they are necessary. They can, surveys help in determining potential rain shifts. As climate changes, or as these seasons get longer, if you have a drier year versus a rainier year, maybe if you can, or uh, if there's an earlier survey versus a later survey, you can compare and see what's changed, what used to be there in the 60s, what's there now, things like that. And then you can uncover it, uh, interesting things like, why are there aquatic species in terrestrial habitats, or are there aquatic species in terrestrial habitats, and then explore that thought. And then surveys, of course, allow you to know, are there introduced species in our area, are they at the preserve? Are these invasive species? So finally, at White Rock, total on that list, there are 46 species of weevil from 12 subfamilies. Huge, broad range of diversity. 25 from the glade, I'm sorry, 25 from the hill prairies, 10 from the glade, and then 20 from the forested areas. Habitat exclusivity, amongst them, 18 of those species, and I noted it with that X, were only found on the hill prairies, nowhere else. Four, interestingly enough, were only found on the glade. And that glade sort of resembled those other larger hill prairies. That is that more rockier area, but it resembled the hill prairies for if you've ever been out there. But four were specific just to that glade. It didn't occur on Evans Hill or the North Prairie. And that was interesting. Um, and then of course 16 were strictly associated with the forested areas. They were not in the glade. And I tried to do that in as clear a way as possible. It was kind of difficult while the species linked with the X denotes presence at White Rock. So what can we do with this now? This is a baseline of weevil diversity at White Rock. We know what's there now, or at least we know what a portion of what's there. So in the future, we can determine what's changed or what uh, has moved in or what's not there anymore, things like that. And of course, it will contribute to development management practices that promote all taxa diversity. You can think about these things when you're doing your uh, pesticide spraying or when you're doing things like on the prairies, those berms. You can keep in mind these uh, weevils, et cetera, things like that. Hey, Corey. Yes. Okay, so you, you get all the collections and stuff like that. So did, would you say there's like uh, 50 of those bugs per Square foot, a thousand. I mean, obviously, it really depended. Areas. When you go out in White Rock yeah. and you're in an area, there's a weevil around you. Some, like there is one around you. Right. Probably multiple weevils around you. Right. They are everywhere. Whether you're always going to find them or see them is a difficult part. Yeah. A lot of times in the wood areas, they might be up in the canopy. They might be down in the soil, feeding on those roots. So they are sort of difficult sometimes to know exactly what is around you. Uh, you could say there's a lot or a little. A lot. 
a lot. There are a lot of weevils at White Rock. I mean, so would you take, say, pounds per acre? Oh, I don't even know. <laughs> I, don't even know. Like, you know I mean, I have actual numbers of what I collected. Pounds per acre? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it would be a lot. Yeah. Tons per acre. Tons per acre? Okay. It'd be a lot. So they're really a big, important part of the They really are. Mm -hmm. You don't often think of weevils. I mean, I didn't know what a weevil was three years ago. I mean, just their feces actually fertilize the farm, probably. Yes, when they are on those plants, they are collecting pollen. And yeah. Sometimes when they are moving to other plants, they act as pollinators. When they're eating those acorns, or when they're, I mean, not necessarily acorns, but those other seeds and things like that, yeah, they could be acting uh, to help with those processes as well. So yeah, they are pretty important. Yeah. And you wouldn't often think that about them. And they distribute them. Yeah, they can be distributed. Not necessarily specific distributors, yeah. but they could they could be performing the well they do that with fungus obviously right, right. They're able to yes far very good at that and then i think yeah, just one more so now that we know this what maybe some future studies could come from this survey i would like either me or somebody else in the future to more densely sample those wooded areas just from what we read of, or read about just from what we uh, looked at of those bark beetles there are more in Illinois, there are more in this area. I know there are more at White Rock. So I'd just like to more densely sample the wooded areas and figure out which bark beetles are here. Maybe even specifically just look at, focus all my attention on bark beetles, not necessarily uh, all the true weevils. Increased sampling times, I initially tried to do every three weeks, but then it became every three to four weeks as the years went on, because uh, it was just difficult to get out here that oftentimes every month. But I would like to increase sampling times because some of those adults that we uncovered were just emerged for a very short time, maybe even a week, and then they were gone. It was very dependent on which plants were around or when they arose. And then it would be interesting to determine are there differences between local populations? Are the weevils of like Fultz different from the weevils of White Rock or Salt Lick? Are they different than the ones of White Rock? Or not necessarily genetically different, but just are the different species occurring there? Things like that. So, I know it was a lot of information. Are there any questions about weevils or the survey or collecting techniques or what weevils look like? Any burning issues? <laughs> any things you saw? If not, I would like to take this time to thank Penn and Carl on the clifftop for giving me the opportunity to survey out there. It was a huge part of uh, my graduate career, so I'm getting my thesis with. I was very, very grateful. If you haven't been to White Rock, you should definitely go. This is just a small glimpse of how beautiful those areas are. There are all in this area, preserves and parks and things. You should definitely check it out. I recommend it. It's one of my favorite places. But anything else? If not, you're more than welcome to come look at my uh, sampling collection, and if you want to see weevils, you can mix these up, it's okay, just don't drop them. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, are they uh, preserved like that because of their size versus traditional Good question. Penny? You would pin weevils. Most people pin them immediately. Because I look at them so much, I like to keep them in ethyl alcohol because you can manipulate them and move their legs around. When you pin them, there's a slight breeze will break off the leg or rostrum. And when they're so small like this, if I had them all pinned, I didn't want to risk breaking some of those. So I keep them in ethyl alcohol because it's just easier mm -hmm. to keep them wet and keep them moist and not break them so much. And they're easier to store that way too. Eventually they will all be pinned. But you're more than welcome to come uh, look at some of these. I try to keep the weave on. All these are on your list. They're not all of them, of course. But I try to keep the ones that we looked at. You can just look at the size of the weevils. Or you have any questions? Corey? Yeah. Um, from your survey results mm -hmm. and your consult consulting with Anderson and O'Brien, is there anything found at White Rock that was an unusual surprise? I thought so. Uh, they haven't I haven't actually got to talk to them since I got my results back, the actual results. Uh, Robert didn't say anything was unusual. 
he did recommend that maybe sometime I try and find, which we will, it was difficult to track down previous surveys, to try and find out if there's a collection stored somewhere else in Illinois hmm. that I can compare mine to, maybe see where they were collected. There isn't actually a survey, or a, it's not written down, I can just, can't just go find literature, this was here. So he told me we need to track down places and see, but nobody actually said, oh wow, why is that there? So not that I know of. There are a few uh, weevils, which is not uncommon, that he kept when he was identifying them. So he like, he's like, oh, it's a nice species, and uh, kept it, but I don't know. Okay. But he didn't actually tell me. I'll ask him when I see him next week. If they're so darn small, that's got to increase the challenge of your research tremendously. Yeah. Is it just something you develop an eye for after a while or something? Uh, yeah. Do you have a microscope out in the field with you that you take out with you? Take, oh, take it back to the lab. Just yeah. a hand ma ma magnifier is all you use on the field? Or I don't use hand You don't use anything. You my use eyes have gotten worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this past year, my eyes have gotten worse. I look at worse. that, and it's just like, God, I don't know how you do this. A lot of times, <laughs> you just get so used to what they look like. Yeah. Once you have a search image, you see it. Yeah. Maybe even now that you know what they look like, you'll probably start seeing more weevils when they're out there, just because you know what they look like. So then you start to say, um, you start to see certain things like, is that shoulder raised? And you can kind of see that some of those like, oh, well, that's, that's a fan. But this is all with the naked eye, you can pretty much, I was wondering if some of those specimens are pretty I nice. can try, yeah. Like, I have to put it on my hand or on white, and I can see. Yeah, you just get used to it. They're just small features. Like, some okay. of those weevils have, like, a channel that's dug out in their chest, and you'll see that, or there's a weird protrusion on some of them. Hmm. You just get used to it, I guess. Wow. After staring at them all this time. this is all with the naked eye, correct? You don't have a hand magnifier? Not in the field. Now back in the lab, when I want to know species, and I'm using that key step by step, that is with a microscope. And you sit there with a microscope, high powered dissecting scope, not a right. compound scope. Not a exactly. Scope right. You just sit there with a probe and forceps and just step by step, read that key. Wow. It's the claw. Tedious. Very, very tedious. But, uh, yeah, I, what I would recommend if you're interested in weevils and you want to study weevils is choosing a subfamily. I want to study the bark beetles or I want to study the broad nose weevils. I wouldn't, I want to study really on I assume weevils. there's a lot of folks studying the entomologists, studying the ones that cause you know, massive economic damage yeah. right on the trees out west and stuff, wouldn't you think? You would think, I don't know. You're not familiar with okay. Well, the more I get familiar with these other people studying it, there aren't a lot of people studying weevils. Mm. There's not a lot of funding associated with studying weevils, mm. for one. And they are so difficult, most people kind of, you know, want somebody else to study those. But there aren't a lot of people studying weevils. Mm. There aren't any that are crops or anything? There are a few. It's a good point. I meant to mention that. Most people, when they think of weevil, they think of like the alfalfa weevil, the bull weevil, things that come through and just destroy crops. There are a few, just a few though. Must do not. Given that there are so many, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like your estimate of per acre too. Um, they, they've got to play an enormous role in the overall food chain. Um, yeah. Would you suggest that they're more likely to be eaten by other arthropods? Um, you know, I, I yes. posted a bird picking the leaf litter. Right. Would be delighted to find a snack. Right, I think it would just be an extra snack and the bird wasn't necessarily looking for the weevil because they're so small. But uh, I would assume it would mostly be other octopods or other spiders, uh -huh. things like that. Because the weevils are everywhere, it must be a nice so they're a bottom of spider. Chain. But that hardened, those, they're like a beetle, so they had the hard shell. Some of these are very, very, very hard. So it would be hard to uh, chew through. They would have to have those chewing mouth parts. So, or larger things like birds, everything else would be considered. <coughs> I got a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So an introduced forest, kind of like mine, as an example, how long would it take, or is it even known, for like the ones that like you're finding at White Rock, mm -hmm. right? All the different various species that are there. How long would it take to get into an introduced forest? Because they're not probably there. Those more generalist species, yeah, probably already there. At the moment, like they've probably moved into your introduced forest. The more specific, yeah, it would take time for them to 
search. So if a forest is like a forest of, of an old uh, growth forest is two miles away, then you would say because they go, they do fly. They we, yeah, we can see that distance by those aquatic uh, species being up in the, the hill prairies. Right. So they can't travel long distances. I would say unless you're introduced forest was in the middle of just miles of field, we was have probably already moved into the introduced forest. Like, so it would take years, or just a few years. If that, All right. I would think within one growing year, they could disperse and move into that forest. Okay. They're very, very, very specialized. They're very good at what they do. That's why there are so many of them. They're very diverse, and that's why they're everywhere. I, I don't know if this helps or hurts you understanding and questions about volume of weevils. Um, we did that tick seminar earlier yeah. with two with an MD and the world's leading tick expert and he found up to five thousand ticks per square yard. When he set a trap. When he set a trap. Um, so we're probably talking hefty amounts of weevils. More than the ticks, I would imagine. That's a lot of weevils to make a pound. Like I can't even. Kind of the opposite of the question Carl asked earlier. Were there any species or uh, genera that you were kind of thinking you would see that were absent? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was one. Let's see what species. One called the strawberry weevil. It's a pretty big generalist, and it was supposed to be in this area. I thought that I had collected it. I keyed it out wrong. I didn't have it. That's one of the only weevils that I knew ahead of time, really, before I got used to what they look like and their names. And what stuff. So were, we, were we at the edge of its distribution? We're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of it. Yeah. It's called a strawberry, but it is wild strawberries, so not so necessarily. Oh, very yeah. nasty. But there are wild strawberries. Right, there yeah, are. Why not? Yeah, well, there so, are. I mean, the it's distribution questions like this that become really, really interesting in that is this an indicator of um, global heating? And that exactly. it, it's not making it in this area, it's not reproducing mm -hmm. as successfully. Exactly. Now that we know what's there, we can compare that in the future. I will I admit, what is on this list is probably not the complete amount of weevils that are a white rock. Like, there are so many. Uh, I would like, need a lot more hands to collect all these weevils. If there were several people going out, because each one of these weevils, especially some of these more specific ones, are associated with a certain type of plant. So if some were able to, like, I'll take the milkweeds, I'll take the asters and just go and look at that plant all year long, just that type of plant, we might have seen more than what we did. Mm -hmm. but, so. so you see different weevils on a plant depending on time of year it is? Mm -hmm. You do. I was seeing differences within April and May wow. going out there. Like they just switch. Because those generalists, they are in competition with each other. So a lot of those will come at different times of the year, try and reduce competition with that food source. Any other burning questions? I hope I didn't confuse it too much with the taxonomy. I wish, I wish it were the weevils were easier. It would make all of our lives. How did you end up? You studied me as an entomologist, obviously. Yeah. You are. And how did you end up? Out of all the different avenues you could. How did I end up with the weevils? Career, how did you end up with weevils? Yes. Yeah. I guess a good question would be: If I knew what I do now, would I have chosen weevils? I don't know. And the uh, doctor would help guide you to this, or kind of. I one of my friends is working at Fultz. If you're familiar with Fultz, is down yes, the road. Oh, yeah. And I went out, and I actually did my undergrad research. Uh, I came and helped with the burns and things like that. So you got familiar with here. Right. I was at Fultz a oh. lot, and I loved. I liked Fultz, and she was studying the ants there. Doctor. And then we were out there one day, and we were just seeing all these beetles just flying all in the air. I'm like, what? What's that? And someone said it was a weevil. I was like, okay, and I kept it in the back of my head. So I was originally wanting to study spiders for my graduate, because the spiders at faults or whatever, we had a bunch of collective and stuff, but we switched to weevils and thought, I'll do that. Oh, it was your experiences at faults that it decided? Yeah, definitely. And well, out in this area. Very good. And I thought, why not? Survey? And then of course, uh, 
that was about the same time that Cliff or that White Rock was purchased. Yep. Yes. When I first started thinking about when I wanted to do my graduate work, and so it was. I don't study weevils. I want to study weevils at White Rock. Mm -hmm. That's how that arose. Okay. And now, are you good? We're very happy that we were able to conduct the research there, and um, we I'm hope very happy to do we'll it. be able to continue. We <laughs> hope that some of the follow-up studies that you are recommending will get done. Um, it'll be interesting very for us <coughs> to see research <coughs> of this kind. Thank you.